Okay, so good afternoon, evening everyone. I'm Akil Aline, your host for the evening, and uh, I'm happy to be hosting this discussion on behalf of the Black Community Resource Center here in Montreal. Just to begin, I'd like to say we're gonna be discussing the intergenerational transfer of culture, how it's passed down from generation to generation in a particular family here in Montreal's black community and what, uh, by extension, the rest of us can learn from those lessons. So uh, why don't we begin by just having each one of you state your name and uh, just a brief, brief description of yourself. Uh, hello. Sean Lewis, better known as Daddy, Grandpa. <laughs> That's about it. But, well, you could tell I'm the eldest here. So, whatever question you want to ask, ask me. I know everything. <laughs> yeah, my name is Malika, uh, Malika Ford. I am Sherwin's daughter and mother to this lady right here. <laughs> and auntie to the other person. And they'll introduce themselves. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Nefertari Bakel, this is my mom, and um, I am 15 years old, in grade 9, and yeah. Hi, I'm Phenomenal, um, I dance, and everything, um, I am 14 right now, and um, yeah. Okay, so why don't we start with some general questions for all of the members of the panel, of the family. To begin, can you each describe your cultural background as you see it and some of the traditions, the cultural traditions or practices that each one of you considers most important? So uh, why don't we uh, actually switch it up a bit and go in reverse through the generations. So phenomenal, how about you? What, what do you think of your cultural background to be and uh, what do you think some of the most important traditions are? Oh yeah, so carnival. Um Cooking and stuff, having like like the food that we make, um, like the macaroni pie and things like that, like kalamu, those traditions, and like family dinners. Like, uh, I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal. Nefertari? Oh, Nefertari, sorry. Phenomenal Nefertari. I'm, um, I'm also from Trinidad and Tobago. I, the most important, like, culturally significant thing for me is probably, like, our holiday traditions and stuff. And also carnival, but, like, carnivals are a once a year thing. So obviously, you know, it's not as important as holiday traditions and holiday food and waking up in the morning on Christmas, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's the most important part about it to me. Good, 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 good. Um, so, just a little something. These kids are born in Canada. I too am born here in Montreal. Um, our, my cultural heritage is Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and uh, I consider our folklore heritage and culture to be the most important part to me. Um, uh, we're all members of West Can Folk Performing Company, which is a group here in Montreal. Um, it's been around for over 45 years, maintaining, showcasing our Caribbean folk culture. And in being part of that, it helps me to you know, identify myself and uh, build my self-esteem. So I think that's a really good, important part of our culture that I hold on to. And Mr. Lewis? Well, I love how this thing starts. I'm a Trinidad <laughs> <laughs> I forgot the born in Canada part. But What's lovely about it is that they recognize their heritage right off the bat, yeah? And that is important. It's important for Trinidadians, it's important for Haitians, for Barbados, for St. Lucia, you know, for everybody to recognize that. Especially in this place that's so diverse, multiculturalism, right? Because they had a time in history that we used to lose our culture. When we leave the West Indies, we had a weight of leaving that behind. You know what I mean? You only want to associate with, with Yankee, English, American thing, right? But now, everybody's coming back. So I will leave that there for that, and we're going. <laughs> and actually, what are some of the earliest memories that uh, you have of your cultural background from your own life? I was born in a place called Laventille, right? I, in a house 
with two hands. No, actually, well, you could say two hands because they, one hand lived right next door, the other one lived with us, and my grandmother. So it's my grandmother, my mother and father, my aunt, her husband, and the children. And we're talking about, uh, well, I know it wasn't four bedroom, it was three bedroom, but I guarantee it was two and a half. You know, with a kitchen on the side and the latrine outside, right? And everything was there that you wanted. The love, the family, everything is right here, you know? The fruit trees around there, everything is there. Your cousins, plus my father now, he was uh, one of the guys that used to announce for the carnival at a place called Marine Square. It still have it. Every carnival, Monday and Tuesday, that's what he does. Along with another guy, an Indian guy. And the name just skipped my mind right now. So, Monday, are you ready? Go with all your father. And we sitting down in them stands. Monday and Tuesday, we watching all the bands, everything, right? And then being from up the hill now, Desperado's fan side, and it's a big fan side. Now I kind of shift, uh, I shift, I just in the <laughs> all stars. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I won't hug everything. <laughs> the Canadian generation, the family, Canadian born generation, technically Canadian generation. So, what are some of your earliest memories of your cultural background? Mm. So, we were born, my sisters and I were born here in Montreal. And when I was five years old, we moved back to Trinidad. We stayed there for five years. So, I think living in Trinidad, um, that's the, my earliest memory of my attachment to culture. Right, so that's where I identified with it. I went to school, had friends. Um, you know, you're seeing the, the dancing, you're seeing the carnival, you're seeing Christmas time. You got grannies painting the house, uh, making pastels, making pies. Like this is, these are my earliest memories of my interaction with culture. Yes, of course. And you know, full disclosure, I also come from a Trinidadian <laughs> background myself. And it's interesting you mentioned being born here in Montreal, but then moving back for a few years mm -hmm. because. With me, it was kind of the opposite mm. in a way because although we, my family was living in Trinidad at the time, um, I was actually born while my mom was briefly staying in Toronto, mm. and then we, I went back to was brought back to Trinidad when I was a month old, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, I lived there till I was almost five years old, and then the family came back to Canada. Mm -hmm. So I had a bit of this, a similar experience with my childhood being split between the two countries. Yes. So um, that is a very interesting experience unto itself, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as for the latest generation of the, of the, the next generation of the family, uh, Nefertari, how about you? What's your earliest memory of your cultural um, identity? I think one of my earliest memories is like, because every year we go down to Toronto for the carnival and we go there, when is it, August? Late August? Yeah, every year me and my cousins and my family, we go down to Toronto and we watch the carnival. So I think my earliest memory is probably like being in the stands with my aunties and my cousins and just like watching everything, watching everybody, all the bands pass from like behind the gates. It was so much fun. But yeah, that's probably like one of my earliest, earliest memories. Phenomenal. <laughs> Don't sing that kind of song. No? Of course. It had to, I had to sing. Yeah, I just sing that. <laughs> what about your earliest memory? Um, I think my, my earliest memory was since I danced in West Ham, it was being at a show and like portraying the Afro Caribbean sort of dance. Like um, just being there, not really I knowing what to do. But I could always see my mom in the stands, like she's trying to direct us and stuff. And I just felt really proud to be like, showing other people in my country. Yes. And you know, it's so interesting that um, even things like the names that we give our children, mm -hmm. I find that's especially the case in black cultures, particularly. We, tend, we often tend to give uh, our children names that say something about themselves yeah, meaning, individually yes, sure. and or their background as mm -hmm. well and it's i'm getting that vibe <laughs> right here yes the names like nefertari mm -hmm. and phenomenal so that in itself it seems to me is a cultural tradition being passed down in this family as well maybe it'll come up again in the conversation <laughs> but um also mr lewis 
How would you say your parents, grandparents, your elders passed down your cultural traditions down to you when you were growing up? Story and by living it. Like my aunts, they used to play mass or play pan or anything, but their friends would do it, right? And they would come to the house and when they're sitting, you know, big people talking, if you don't want to get tapped or if you don't want to get sent somewhere, you keep quiet and you listen. <laughs> yeah? So you hear all these stories, you know. And plus my father was a hunter, so when he go in the forest, so I was a lima too, you know. So people coming from all over, you hear about what they're like, um, Bear Nancy, you know, you hear about Dwen, you hear about Sukunia, you hear you hear things you ain't supposed to hear. But <laughs> well, you just stay quiet. But it's all part of the culture. You, you know, you even hear about the, the African culture, you get the Indian culture because you're going to school, you have guy friends who are Indians, right? You have friends who are Chinese, right? They have holidays in Trinidad for each culture that's there. And Trinidad is a real multicultural place. You know, so it's all it's right there. It's, you don't have to go to it. It's there waiting for you. You walk out your house, you're with your Indian, see your Indian partner, right? My mother said we have in prayers, but you have to come. You have to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? The Chinese partner, well, they have it, five, five, they call it in Trinidad. You go on your bus line for that, right? The drumming, they had the Shango, they had the Baptist. You know, and well, it was in such a way that I don't know if you ever experienced it, but they say drums is cold, yes. right? That as a child, your parents watching you. When call them drums playing up the hill, and then fellas going and, and them girls and them women and they doing the thing, and they watching you. Because anytime you do something, you make us say, hey, you come back here, <laughs> <laughs> because they know what it is. The beat, get in here. You know, and you want to go to it, you want to be part of it, right? So, the culture was always there, it's always there. It's just a matter of not stepping away from it, mentally stepping away from it, because it's right there for you. Indeed, and uh, same question, of course, again, for the Canadian-born generation of the family, Malika, so um, would you say that it's easy to see how the culture might have just been naturally passed down to future generations in Trinidad itself, right. right? But growing up here in Canada for the most part, would you say that there was more of a, maybe a deliberate effort on your parents' part to make sure you stayed involved in activities that connected you to your culture, or did it sort of just come naturally? Hmm. So as I mentioned before, we, we grew up for a couple of, five years in Trinidad. Um, and I think that our, our family is just culturally inclined. Like, it, you, you cannot escape it, right? They're, they're in culture. Like you said, my grandfather, even my, gra my grandmother on my mother's side, she used to make costumes for the big bands. So it's like you cannot escape the culture. Um, and granddaddy said, you know, they're big people linemen. You hear things. They're talking about stuff, the stories. It's just, it's just always there, and it's, it's not something that we shied away from. And it could be that we were in Trinidad, and we, you know, we were all part of the culture. So when you come here to Canada now, yes, my mom was like, you know, I'll buy you Milli Vanilli tape, and we'll get you some, some Canadian stuff, and we're gonna eat spaghetti and all that stuff. But you know, we, we, we were used to having Sunday food, kalu, macaroni pie, roti, pilau. So like when we come here now, we still have these traditions that we still follow. And even with them passing it down to them. Uh, they don't have a choice. Like we're we're, we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, they just have to cook a little more. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. We're doing it. We're passing it down. Now it's a matter of what what are they willing to to take. keep and, and take and and hold on to. That's that's the, the challenge I'm seeing right now, is because you know we're competing with with North American society and the hip hop and American society and and them. You know, are they going to value what we value? Did we are we valuing what he values? Right, so I mean, I think a little bit is lost in every generation, but we're still trying to hold on.
Right. And we'll be hearing more about that as we go on, that's for sure. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Lewis, have you noticed any changes in how a lot of those traditions have been practiced by each generation? So would you say Malika's generation does it maybe a little differently than your generation did and maybe the grandkids? Are there's, there's, there's always a difference. There's always going to be a difference. But what I find right now is like the parents are bringing the children, making the effort to bring the children into it, right? This generation. Let's say, genera not even my generation, uh, my generation, yeah. Because I came up here when I was 14, right? So when you look at the cultural aspect of what's going on here, you didn't used to see a lot of kids, right? You see more bigger fellas. But well, they come to the line, right? They come to the party, they come to the drinking, they come to the eating, they come to the, you know, the liming, right? They didn't used to bring out, well, we didn't have no set of children, but still, there was, a, there was something missing in between, right? But now, it's like more children coming into it. The parents are making the effort to bring the children into it. I think the best way I, I could really think, I think it was a, a protective thing because knowing where we come from, knowing what we are capable of, and you're making children here, yeah, but you may want to expose them to them kind of bad thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we have some bad things in you too. You know what I mean? So you're, you're, you're protecting them from that. But in doing that protection, you kind of take them away from the, the culture. You know, there's a lot that you take them away from because you want them to develop more here, more Canadian culture, because not the culture so much, but Canadian race, Canadian race, so they could fit in, right? But hey, they have their culture, they have the West Indian culture, and they fit in, but still. Yeah, we make sure that we bring the children to West Can, yeah. dancing, drumming, singing, and just involving them in it, being around it. It's like they don't know anything else. Right, <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. And so, uh, for the middle generation, uh, Malika, would you say, actually, you kind of began to answer the question already with your mention of Millie Vanilli and all of that, uh, <laughs> that era, I'll be sure, and whatnot, but how would you say you adapted your cultural traditions to fit into, you know, the reality of living here in Canada? Mm -hmm. <sighs> so, uh, we left Trinidad when we were young, so it's, it's... You think so? <laughs> I think we, it was adapted a while ago and we are, we're just continuing the, the work. But again, things are not the same. So when you go to Trinidad and you join in a, a dance group, it's just like, you know, drumming and dancing and everybody's going, going, going. You come here now and these children don't even want to come to practice, right? They don't see the, the, the reason of it. It's like if um, it's just for for presentation but when you go back to the caribbean it's a way of life of the village right, yeah. it is a way of life everybody's dancing everybody's drumming everybody's singing it's 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 traditions that that are grown out of the people right but here we're just trying to you know teach them and then they can just wrote re recite it but they have to go back we have to go back <laughs> we're going back and we're going deep in the village <laughs> You know, it's interesting you say that too. I've always wondered that about uh, West Can, mm -hmm. and especially the youngest kids in the mm -hmm. world. I was wondering, you know, because I remember when I was a kid and I started playing Pan in elementary school back in the 90s mm -hmm. when, oh, Lord, this was more than 30 years ago. <laughs> but uh, I remember when Sala Wilson came around to a lot of the elementary and high schools mm -hmm. in Montreal and started steel bands at each one. This is when my elementary school, some of that still existed. And I was in grade three at the time. And um, so I just naturally joined, and I, up, even up to that point, I'd overheard my mother talking about growing up in Trinidad when there was a taboo associated with mm -hmm. saying that. For sure. on, you know? So um, I was fascinated by it just for that reason. But by the time I reached high school, all the kids, especially the kids a year ahead of me, once they went off to high school, it was, oh, well, we have basketball. Mm -hmm. yes, it was always basketball practice. <laughs> oh, oh well, we can't make it because it's basketball. So I've always wondered uh, how, how easy it is to keep the, the young ones uh, involved. It, it is not very easy. It, is, it isn't at all. But, you know, we try to bring them with us, keep them close, and try to um, 
keep them interested in it. And there's different ways of adapting the folklore to keep them interested, right? Even with bringing different things, we do steel pan. That had them, yes, a new instrument for them to learn. Even this summer, yeah, this summer you guys, oh, that last summer, sorry. You guys did the steel pan, we did mass making, we did calypso, like all these things have to be brought to their attention, exposed to, and yeah, figure out ways to, to keep them interested. Mm -hmm. And now for the younger generation again, from your point of view then, so what were some of these methods that you guys found more appealing Right? Did any of that really speak to you guys and make you genuinely more interested in getting or staying involved? Um, I think when I see like other youth like me doing like like for for example like carnival, when I see like people my age doing Toronto carnival, I'm like oh my gosh, I want to go to Toronto carnival. And when I see people my age like okay yeah we're gonna do Montreal carnival, I want to do Montreal carnival. So I feel like it's like when you see people like you doing it, that's when you're like, okay, yeah, I want to do it also. Like, when we're dancing, and we can see that, like, when we're doing a performance or something, and we can see that there are people our age in the stands, or people our age in the audience, and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, that's so cool, we want to do it too. So it's very much like a, how do I explain, like, you, you see other people, and you're like, okay, yeah, I also can be like that. Uh, yeah. That's right, that's right. And phenomenal yourself, would you say the same or anything else that tends to appeal to you on a gut level? Um, the same, I think. Yeah, it was carnival and everything. Um, but yeah, just like, and making masks too, like, you know, like, uh, like making the costumes or seeing people like, like, because I went to a mask app before and like seeing younger children being like kiddies carnival. You know, seeing them like in their costumes, I was like, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, I think that's important too. Even thinking back to my own childhood, because carnival was a big part of my childhood as well. Here in Montreal, Toronto, Caravana, of course. And at the end of the day, I think a big part of it was that it's music, it's dancing, it's partying, it's fun. Costumes, mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Kids enjoy that kind of thing, generally speaking. Maybe mm -hmm. some kids more than others. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I always enjoyed pelting this. You know, so <laughs> it wasn't hard to get to convince me to get involved by any means. So okay, so um, it's interesting because we've covered a lot of the, the subject matter we needed to tackle anyway, just sort of in the course of the conversation, which is just how I like it. So um, for the younger generation in particular. A Nefertari and Phenomeno. How do you guys feel overall about these cultural traditions? And do you see yourselves keeping these traditions going in the future when you get old enough to start having your own kids? You see yourselves passing these traditions on to the next generation? I definitely do. Like, I definitely want to, definitely. But I get scared sometimes because. I don't have an accent per se, and then my grandparents have accents, and my parents have slight accents. So what's what's it gonna be like for like my grandchildren? Like, are they even gonna know like what what the accent is? Like, what being Trinidadian is? Um, I feel like I definitely do want to pass it down to my kids because I love my culture. I love being from Trinidad. I love like I love carnival, like I've already said. I love dancing. I love drumming. I love the, just the culture in general. So of course that's something I want to pass down to my kids. But like Phenomenal said, it's like a difficult thing because like I'm already Trinidadian, but like kind of removed because I was born here. My mom was also born here. So my kids are going to be born here. So it's like, if they were to say, oh yeah, I'm Trinidadian, like already me, I say, oh, I'm Trinidadian, but I'm like, am I? So then for them, they would be like, oh, I'm Trinidadian, but it's like, they're more removed from it already. So it's a little bit more difficult. Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> there are Trinidadians all over the world. All right? As long as you are Trinidadian, you know you associate your Trinidad. Your people from Trinidad. Are your people from Trinidad? You from Trinidad. Alright? I know the people from Trinidad. So don't worry. You're not a song like if you're from down south or you're from, you know, any part of the, the word, the accent is not what makes you a Trinidadian. The accent is a little icing on the, on the cake. Yeah? But a Trinidadian is a Trinidadian. You know what's going on in Trinidad, you know the culture, you have to know your pan, or you know the pan, you know your mass, you know your calypso, 
you know your folklore, or you know how to line, because all you do is line by all yourself. I see that already. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you get to know the country. You know, you travel the country and you get to know the country. You travel to Trinidad, you travel to Tobago. And which is something that's happening a lot more even in Trinidad and Tobago. People are really exploring the island. You know, and which is good. So Yeah. That's why I said we have to go back. We have to take them back. Yes. Like it it's essential. You have to know where you come from to know where you're going to go. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, very true. And it's interesting. Um, does the family have a lot of relatives still living full time in Trinidad? Yeah. Quite a few, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah he has yeah. one brother that's still living in Trinidad. Yeah. Um, my mother has no no siblings there, but we have cousins and cousins you know, by the dozens. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> no, we, yeah. we make it a point to go back every year. Yeah and take the children with us, yeah? Yes, so they get yes. to live. See, I can relate to that too, because I got mm. cousins about a dozen. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, mainly on my father's side, and as you all know, one of my mm -hmm. older brothers also right. uh, lives in Trinidad. Yeah. So, um, and I was able to spend the holidays uh, month, this past holiday season in Trinidad as well. So, mm -hmm. yes, it always helps if you can visit. Yeah. And of course, if you have family there, that helps as well. Um, and I always say, you know, I would like if I ever have kids, I would definitely make every effort to keep them in touch yes. with their roots. Do, yeah. Having family there obviously helps a great deal. When it comes to the accent, uh, I remember growing up being very self-conscious about my accent because I, I learned to speak in Trinidad, mm. but then I lost the accent. They always, my family always tells me I lost it two weeks off the plane <laughs> because I was not quite five years old when I came back up. And um, yeah, it was just, uh, I was always very self-conscious about it as a kid, even to some extent today, but I always say, at least I can tell a Trini, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from a mile away mm -hmm. just by hearing the accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I remember I was in the hospital in Washington, D.C. 11 years ago, and it turned out one of the doctors came into my room and he had a pure Trini accent. Mm -hmm. So I said, after we talked business, I said, so what part of Trinidad are you from? And he broke into a smile and started <laughs> chopping it up. And it turned out he knew half my cousins. Oh, yeah, see? <laughs> so uh, I would love for any any children or nieces and nephews, some of which I already have growing up, to be able to do the same thing. And also to be able to tell the different accents from the different islands. Because mm -hmm. well. yeah, growing up here in Montreal, you, you get to know yeah, exactly. lot, from man. all across yeah. the Caribbean, yeah, the whole African lot. diaspora, mm -hmm. essentially, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Right at West Canada itself, a celebration mm -hmm. of all of exactly, those exactly. Right? So that's a big part of it as well. Mm. So when it comes to the cross, the interaction between the generations, can each of you share an example of a time when different generations of the family came together to celebrate a particular cultural tradition? We always come together, like every Sunday, every almost every evening we're together. Granny, me, them, like we all get together and eat. We share meals. We do a lot of activities together. It's just, it's just that's that's the way we do it. Yeah, just like he said, he grew up with his aunts and his uncles in the same house. That's how we do it. Like I'm three minutes away from my mother, so yeah. we walk over, we drive over, everybody get together, make the meals, we make in pilau, we make in stew peas, we make in pastels for Christmas. Everybody is together all the time, doing what we gotta do. I don't want to eat my coconut. I want to eat some good food. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and what's that like for you, young ones? Um, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, coming. Going to my grandma's house like almost every day, going there every holiday, um, um, Christmases, staying over the night before, sleeping there, waking up, you know, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, since I live with my grandmother, they're always coming over and. Uh, <laughs> the community <laughs> center. But, yeah, and then. Um, and you, especially Christmas, Thanksgiving and stuff, we have more family coming over and we have to dress up the table nicely, mm -hmm. clean the house, and I personally help prepare the food because I'm there. Hey. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Good for you, good for you. Yes, yes, yes. And so, um, has there ever been any disagreements? between the generations about certain cultural practices. Even if it's just the question of what's the right way to do it, what's the right way to season certain dishes, or that type of thing, you know? Personally, like I 
said, ask me, I know everything. Right? <laughs> and one of the things I know is that let young birds have to learn to fly. So you let them fly. You know what I mean? You see a wall, you can tell them, duck when they reach any wall, and then they say, hey, go, and they hit the wall, and they go no next time. <laughs> you know? So you let them go, you keep eye on them, right? And you, you check. Not talking down to them, right? If they want to listen to a smooth dog or whoever they want to listen to, go ahead and listen to that. I had my Stevie Wonder, I had my James Brown, you know what I mean? I have a real thing that they know some of it, right? But uh, especially this one, you see, you listen to some music, I just say, uh huh, what you eat? <laughs> <laughs> so even speaking of the music, it's like I like to listen to soca, reggae, Caribbean type music, and you know I play it all the time in the car. And I'm like, don't you want to listen to some soca? You should listen to soca, and you should listen to reggae, and you should, da -da 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 -da, you know. And I hear her bumping her hip hop and her this and her that. And like I'm like, oh gosh, this music, it's not for me. But then I, I play these songs and I hear her singing. So it's like it's getting in. So you know, we don't have to. <laughs> Resistance is too tight. It, it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my third sister, how old? Seven, six. Six, yeah. six, six years. Not in this last carnival. It had some calypso that was playing. And every time I tried to sing it, I, well, I think I know the words, but I didn't really know the words. Next thing in the car, I hear any calypso singing in the background. This little girl singing it. <laughs> <laughs> she know all the words. <laughs> what? So you can't, you can't hide, you can't get away from it. <laughs> and, and you find it, do you find it appealing when you hear the damn, younger generation? Damn right, man. With those yeah, damn right, you know? I mean, I like their music too, you know, because I listen to it, you know? Listen to it. Like I said, grew up with here in Pan, and I didn't even talk about Pan because I know all them bad area. I know when man from this Pan side couldn't cross this street. I know when bottle flashing in the sky. I know all, all of them kind of thing. Even here in Montreal, and I was to say something. This carnival and Toronto, Toronto, Toronto. Montreal had one of the best carnivals in North America, right? The first steel band to come down on oh gosh, rocks come from that project right there. Right? We built that there. And we went down St. Catherine Street with that. Toronto, we used to run from Toronto to come down here to play mass and enjoy the line. And we had to go there. But it's alright. Everybody go through growing paint. We will go out of it. <laughs> you know? And we will get there. What? And so, when it comes to things like technology, how would you say that's affected the way that the family preserves these cultural traditions? Does it make it easier, harder, both? Things like uh, social media, of course, that's bound to come up, or you know, WhatsApp, and with different ways of staying in touch with people long distance. Well, we do that a lot. Everybody here on WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 maybe simplified it in a way we can share different aspects of culture. You see something, post on something online, you can post it. I can share it to them on WhatsApp or wherever they are. Um, uh, I don't yeah. know. I think but it, 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 okay. makes, it makes it easier too, because in the sense, no, when I say easier, you, you're more open up now because you're using the technology, right? You get different, like I have friends, New York, Toronto, Trinidad, wherever, they see something, they send it for me, and I will go through it. And, hey, that's nice, you know, I'm gonna send it for that one. <laughs> you know? So, you know, after you do your little scanning and you make sure everything's decent, everything, you send it, you know? But at the same time, it could be a bit challenging because we do folklore, and that's not necessarily the, the most present right, um, yeah. form that's online. So that that's where it could be a little bit uh, challenging. Yeah. Are you guys seeing anything with, with Caribbean folk online? No, you're just seeing like hip-hop and Afrobeats? Actually, not Caribbean folk, but I do get things from Trinidad, like Trinidad, 
poetry, things like that. And I like listening to that. Okay, good. Any steel pan you guys uh, see online? No? You have, to, oh, you have to broaden your feed. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you can find these things. I mean, when we were doing the, um, the Ma Carnival is Mass Movement and Music uh, event last fall, and I was playing the role of the Piero Granada, I remember looking up uh, some of the links y'all sent me, and there were, you know, performances of those traditions on YouTube. So a lot of it, sometimes you just have to take a, a literally just a few seconds out of your schedule and just Google it or look it up on YouTube or whatever and you'll find it. You know? But it, it might not occur to you if you don't think of it or if you don't happen to be around people who share it with you, right? So. Waiting, I just have now waiting on with them. Yeah, for them to, to actively in our seek it out, yet. yeah. You know, like I will go in our pannyard and just stay. Okay, and one man could be practicing on a pan there. I, 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 what? I listen to him. <laughs> I sometimes want to get into them to just you know, so they're just taking it in like like a little bit a little bit you know like people who just come and just oh well the lime in all stars here tonight they're supposed to tomorrow night and you just go there for 10 minutes or you know taking a two hours no come come into grandpa and we go sit down in the yard <laughs> yeah. but now they're at that age where I could do that with them because Remember, it's not that they feel living in Trinidad all the time. Well, right now, children from nine years old, seven years old, eight, eleven, twelve, they play music. So they come in, the parents bringing them to the yard and they stay in there. Same thing with making mass, with the kiddies carnival and all of that, right? With the drumming, the parents are there with them. So now I had to wait a little bit now because I can't bring everything on them one time. So no, they had the age where I said, okay, let me go in the pan yard now. And I had to tell them we're going for ice cream and end up in the pan yard. You know? <laughs> but oh, I, didn't I had to find a way to get them there. I didn't let them sit down there for a while. Even with, yeah. the, with the, the costume making. So prior to the pandemic lockdowns, we were every year making kiddies carnival costume for big people costumes, and then everything stopped. And then she's like, mommy. Well, is it time to be making costume? Because this is a, a yearly thing that we did. So that's one of the traditions that, you know, they missed. And then we brought it back this year. So everybody's yeah. hands-on this year bringing, um, making costumes for the kiddies carnival. And sometimes those opportunities come out of nowhere. I remember I was growing up and my mom always used to say, you have to play Pan in Trinidad sometime. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, we'll see when that happens. And then, <laughs> what was it, nine years ago, I came back from living in the States. And lo and behold, uh, Sal Wilson's wife happened to call me and say, are you going to start playing with us again? I hear you back in Montreal. And I was like, uh, yeah, sure, why not? And she's like, you know, we're going to play Pan in Trinidad this summer because they're having an international Pan competition. I was like, what? Sign me up, right? So I got to play Pan in Trinidad uh, for the first time. That was, you never know when those opportunities arise. It's very, very nice when they do. So when it, since, of course, we live in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, these multicultural societies, have y'all ever incorporated other cultures outside of Trinidad, outside of the Caribbean, or even outside of the African diaspora into any of these cultural traditions that y'all practice? And you know what? Let me start with the let me start with the youngest generation on this one, especially since y'all are immersed to a large extent outside of the, your family, at least immersed in this multicultural environment. Um. So I haven't exactly showed them what it's like to do these traditional things but i have told them about it because i'm like oh yeah i'm from trinidad but most of them have never heard of that before so i have to explain it and then they get more interested and more interested and then sometimes when we have events and stuff i show them videos pictures and stuff like that it's like, oh. nice um way to represent by the way <laughs> Um, I think I used to like invite my friends and stuff like this. Like if I would have a show or something, I would invite them and I would show. I don't know if they came though, because everybody's you know busy or whatever. But like, and I would send them videos. Like Fanon said, I would show them videos of like performances I would do, and I would tell them stuff about like, oh, I'm from Trinidad. Like this is what we do, and yeah. But I don't think I've ever really like integrated them into it like too much. Mm -hmm. And the. Middle and general. So, have y'all ever been able to uh, sort of incorporate any other cultural practices or even just like involved folks from other backgrounds in a lot of that, like say the West Can activities, for example? Of course. So, in terms of, so West Can is for 
Caribbean community, right? So not only just Trinidad, Trinidadians, but people from Barbados, Grenada, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, everywhere in the Haiti. We have people from Haiti and in West Camp too. So in that sense, we're, we're multicultural, but I mean, we're all black people and we're all Caribbean people. And it's like, you know, it, we, different parts of the world, we still practice the same things. But um, uh, what was I saying? But in high school and in college my sisters and i we used to we were in west Kansas since we we're like 12 years old so now it's time to go to um, high school and college and we would be choreographing and there are people with yes different um cultural backgrounds that want to learn our dances want to learn our drumming rhythms so we incorporate them into the into the performances so yeah that's nice that's nice and I, again i remember when i was playing pan i would say at least half the members especially by the time i was in high school playing with salas academy maybe half the members of the band were from like non-caribbean backgrounds all together you know and I, we would go to we would participate in the panorama right here in montreal and we would have a band from maine come up yes, all yes. white yeah and they were good yeah, yeah. They weren't just there, they were, they were represents, you know, so, but I always say, I always say, black cultures are magnetic. Mm, for sure. Black cultures, Caribbean, American, yeah. Latino, African, from wherever in the world, we suck other people in. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I always tell people, you know, there's always going to be imitators from other backgrounds who are going to be attracted and drawn to our cultures and want to copy them and so on. So let's make the most of it and make the best of it. That's the way I look at it. I feel like we need to... If you don't hold on to yeah. it. Yeah. And we need to own it. Yeah. That's we need own. to own it. That's the thing. Got to claim it. Got to claim it. Mm. Absolutely. Well, look, I here, yeah, I work with Italians, Greeks, Germans, Swedes, and they all have their own thing. They may not be as forceful about it as we are, right? But when something come around, it's like the Greeks may have a um, uh, see some kind of ch they like church thing, you know what I mean? Orthodox business, and every Greek that come in the garage, that's all they're talking about. That's what they, you know. That's what's happening, right? The Italians, they have their things. You know, they, you want to talk about doing some kind of work in your house with a set and some Italians around? Oh, they have about 20,000 ideas for you. Because <laughs> that's what they like to do. You know? And they, all of them, they have their work. Plus, well, they have the food and everybody have their everything, you know? Have a guy right next door now, Indian guy Raj. I don't even know what part of India he's from. But about two weeks, when they had the Indian arrival in Trinidad, they had something in the mosque here. And coming for the food man nah I can't come now you bring the food <laughs> so all these different cultures and they know because well they know me right I'll be on taking a break I listen to Calypso watching Pan watching some mass and even the Italian guy saying Lord show it I know that song for forward and backward <laughs> I say, yeah, 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 I like that one. T today I like that one. <laughs> right? So you had to listen to it about 20 times. Oh, and also I forgot to say, we have a multicultural fair at our school. Yeah. And this year we actually got some three, three people to dance with us uh, to like show, I think it was three? Four maybe? Four. I don't know. Yeah, four. But yeah. And like we had our flags and everything during mm -hmm. the dance, dancing to today. I mean, this year we danced to uh, Afro, Afro. Yeah, beat? I think it was the Afrobeat song. Yeah. yeah. But last year we did a uh, Trinidadian. So I mean, well, Afrobeat is where it's at these days, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but no, yeah, yeah. I mean, we always have these experiences with people from various backgrounds uh, who are just drawn to our cultures and absorb them to a large extent. And I think it's a beautiful thing, you know, that cross-cultural. Uh, exchange. So when it comes to um, the future generations, uh, what advice would y'all give to future generations, starting of course with your own children uh, in your own family, but in the community at large as well? Uh, what advice would you give about how best to preserve and perpetuate these cultural traditions? I think it, that everything starts at home, right? So ask your mother about it, talk to your, your parents about it, listen to what they say, telling stories, you know, and own it. Because they be telling you something that happened in Barbados or like, they have different names for different entities, dumpy or, you know, they used to use, use those words, you know, put them into your vocabulary. 
right? So you get to, to, to relate now to it and you make a personal connection to your island, to your, 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 your twang, your, your heritage, right? Like she have a nice name, Tamron Sauce. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> She loves it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one was phenomenal. Uh, you don't need to go nowhere else but phenomenal. That that good. Self-explanatory. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but is that, that that that's how you had it, you do it, you know, you just every chance you get, you put a little something in it, or you ask your parents, or you ask them, what, what do you mean by that? Right? Mommy, we when you say that, what do you mean? Right? Like breaking beach. If they may know what breaking beach mean yet, yeah, they have no right to be saying no on this table. <laughs> and this one looks like she don't remember. <laughs> you remember what breaking beach mean? Mm -hmm. You, you no, remember you, after the, the other morning your mother was telling you. You remember after? When you go to the beach. When I ask you how come you ain't going to school. Oh! It's when you're skipping. Right, when you're skipping school. Right? You're breaking beach. You know? So that is that's all I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, be curious. Um, be curious. Use those words, you know? Yeah. Uh, embrace your culture. Be proud of your culture. Don't try to uh, hide it. No. Yeah. Don't give it up and take other people on yeah. it. Yeah. Taller, taller, taller. And be willing to share your culture with Watch others. Watch it. And the more you know, the more you grow. It's true. It's very true. And I mean... The other communities, they do it. Even if you don't necessarily see them doing it, they do it. They do it. Yeah. I remember growing up with uh, Chinese kids who went to Chinese school every Saturday. Mm -hmm. I didn't even learn about this until later, but Italian and Greek kids went to Italian and Greek school every weekend. You yeah. know what I mean? They go out of their way to make sure that kids know their cultures, and why shouldn't they? That's why I think West Ken is important, right? right? So we have, we have children's classes, we have classes for adults, so it's like, they go to school all week with people that don't look like them and they come, the parents have said this to us, we bring them here because this is a place where they can meet people that look like them. One little girl was like, oh, going to another girl, your hair looks, your hair styles the same as mine. That warmed my heart. I'm like, yo, we're here together to share our culture, pass things on from one generation to the next and we value that a lot. Yeah, and as a parent, I am very proud of all of them, you know, for what they're doing, right? I'm not, I am the only, Unofficial member, <laughs> official unofficial member of Westcan. I am not a joiner, but I will be there to support. Man, this roof could be falling down. I'll find a way to keep it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or get help to keep it up. <laughs> and it's so true what you say about how it starts at home. I remember when I was living in the states, I went to law school at a Jewish university. Fascinating three three years of my life because I remember talking to these Jewish youth about how they preserve their cultures. And I remember one student I knew was a year behind me, she said she and her roommates got a subsidy for their rent. This is in Manhattan, not a cheap place to live. Their rent was subsidized every month by a Jewish community organization. What was the catch? They had to throw at least one party in the house every month for Jewish youth. Oh, wow. Some catch. I was like, sign me up. It's almost enough to make me convert. You know? Uh, and I remember another classmate of mine said, you know, um, the whole Sabbath tradition every Friday evening, uh, we have Shabbat dinner with our families. And she said, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. You know, we bring our families together and it's like having a house party yeah. every week. Yeah. It makes you want to stay Jewish. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's great to hear in a family like yours the way y'all do basically the same thing, mm -hmm. only from a Trini cultural yes. perspective, right? And you're preserving that culture and you're making it fun and enjoyable for the youth. That way they're going to be naturally motivated yeah, sure. to continue to uh, pass that tradition. Uh, I'll tell you something, even when I was going to high school here, we had people from all over the West Indies, you know, all of us around the same age. We all play in the same sports around the same time of year in the cricket season. You, you naturally know when it's cricket season. You know when it's football season. You know when it's time to fly kite. Right? We formed an association. The nice part about it is we put Basel. <laughs> Basel is a white fella from Trinidad. Yeah? You know, Trinidad white is Trinidad white, but it's still Trinidad. Yeah? We put him as the head of the organization to go and talk to this, the, whoever he had to talk to in the school. And it's like, 
you from Trinidad? Yeah, 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 no, no. <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, what do you all want? They, we had everything we wanted. We had a a football. The, well, they had the football field. Eh? We had a cricket pitch in the middle of the football field. Well, you know what I mean? We tend to roll and all that. The Canadian called society here who are in charge of our team, the school, they are willing to give you what you need. You have to know what you want and you have to go about to get it. Because if if we didn't go and say we want to play cricket, okay, so all you need to do, you, so that will keep you guys quiet and you're out of trouble? Yes. All right, what do you need? So where is the budget? Blah, blah, blah. Give it to them. We have bat, we have ball, we have pads and things. Yeah, but we need a cricket pitch. Where's that cricket pitch? Where's that cricket pitch? So then the cricket pitch, where, where are you going to put it? In the middle of our football. <laughs> you think the top, the, the, the guys who played football, they say, well, it's okay, you know, it's not going to bother us. Yeah, hey, we good. You know? Exactly. And who don't know what it was, what we were doing, they come around, you go to the class, and you're in the class. What game you guys playing in the back there? Cricket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Football, right? We got two days. Soccer wasn't a big thing then. Now, soccer is woo, kicking up in, in this place, which is good. You know, it's the same thing we had to keep doing with our culture, you know, Absolutely. in our community. And they're doing it. So, exactly. all the way. So finally, last question for all the generations of the family. Is there anything else each of you would like to share about the importance of cultural traditions and transferring them from generation to generation? The floor is open. Anybody? Jump in. I think I would leave my answer right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it I is very it important. It's very, very important. Um, I really find that our culture Caribbean culture is very, very rich, and there's a lot about it that we don't even know yet, right? A lot of history that we don't know, a lot of things that we have to put together, and it's passed down from generation to generation orally most times. So, um, yeah, take the time to learn it, listen to your elders. When there's, there's, and storytelling is so big in our culture, right? We're always talking. We lime in, we're talking, we're telling stories, we're, um, yeah. I think it's important to go back to where like your family came from, uh, your family has come from, because we went in um, February to Trinidad and Tobago actually, but um, in Trinidad we went during Carnival, so that was a very fun experience for me. Lucky. And although I didn't get to like go to Carnival, I saw them on TV and I, some, I got to see my parents and stuff. So, and while I was there, my love for soca music like grew very much. So I have like 10 soca songs on my playlist now. 10? <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> um, I feel like culture is such an important thing for people, like especially for youth, because like your culture is a part of your identity, you know? So like, it you have to go, sometimes, you know, it might not be right in front of you and you have to go searching for it, but you have to because it's such an important thing and it's such an important part, piece of your identity and piece of yourself. That's just like, you know, you, gotta, you have to do the work to acquire it. Yes, very true. And I would, I would just love to add, part of the beauty of it is there's always more to learn. I'm often kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I didn't even know about stick fighting until six years ago, maybe? Um, even though I grew up in this Trini family and I was always hearing about carnival and everything and for some reason I did not, it just didn't, it wasn't something really discussed until, um, I think, in fact I think I only heard about it from that Anthony Bourdain episode oh, wow. on CNN, uh, believe it or not, and then, but then since then that's all I hear about is stick fights and I was like, oh, but there you go, and even the whole story of the Americans, mm -hmm. which is something I only was, I had no clue about it until 2012. I shared an article from a Canadian newspaper on Facebook commemorating the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812. One of our family friends from Trinidad commented on it saying, oh, some of my ancestors fought in that war. I was like, really? You yeah. from Trinidad? Oh, some of your ancestors fighting this war that happened in North America. And she said, there's a whole population of black Trinis who are descended from black American enslaved people 
who were uh, offered their freedom by the British in exchange for fighting on their side in the war. And if they survived the war, they were given safe passage to any part of the empire they wanted, and a bunch of them ended up in Trinidad. Yeah. And I was like, well, how about that? Yeah. You know? So there's always more to Definitely learn. That's did. the beauty yeah, of it. So thank you all so much for joining all of us for this conversation here this evening. And um, I'm looking forward to many, many more years of West Cam. And not just years, but generations. Yes. yes. <laughs> of the family and of the larger West Can family and of the community passing on this rich, rich culture. Trini culture, Caribbean culture, and the culture of the African diaspora at large. So thank you all so very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>